estoy grabando a partir de ahí. Ok. Participante. Y voy a hacer admitir las personas. ¿Podéis ver mi pantalla todos? Sí. Sí. Good afternoon, everyone. We are writing just two minutes, two at five, five minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. Just if we can just wait five minutes, I would like this presentation. Please just unmute your microphone. In the same time, we can wait a little bit to the other attendees. We'll just wait two minutes more, please. And we can start everything. So first of all, good afternoon, everyone. I am really glad to, to set up this webinar this week because today we have really a relevant, interesting purpose. So we will talk today about ethical artificial intelligence, the key tool to address global challenges. So I'm really glad and proud to welcome in our webinar, Canar, City Beats, but also the Catalonia uh, generate that here, and also ID Lab. So we have several speakers connected from US. So today, so thank you so much for your time with the time zone, and also the CEO of City Beats and one of the director of Catalonia generate that. So I will continue. Today, the purpose is to talk a little bit more to highlight the ethical artificial, artificial intelligence community and how the technology can have an impact on the social life, but also all of connected with the smart cities and the government, how we can use the technology as a services for us. Basically, it's for us. So we will learn today, we will go through three different point of view. One of them is from the government, the public administration, the other point of view, it's one of about the concrete business case, I would say about the operation life, about companies. And the third one, it's about how, who, how, and how and who can support this kind of initiative. So I would like to say thank you. Just a little reminder, this session will be recorded, so don't worry if you miss some information. It will be recorded in our website and after in our speaker website. You can find all of the material. So this kind of webinars, the aim is to share and to connect. It's not only a top-down presentation because it's not the purpose of this webinar. The purpose of this webinar is to connect between us and to share knowledge, to share knowledge, but also maybe contacts. So please, in order to fill in and to fulfill this aim, please don't hesitate to ask on the chat box. Don't hesitate to use the chat box that you have on your right side to ask questions. We will have three blocks. So after three blocks of presentation, you can ask. Also open your microphone, microphone, open your video and ask directly to be more real, you know, and to develop this connection. Just during this time, be on mute during the session and quit off. No pressure between us because the idea is to consolidate our tech community in Spain and around the world. The idea is to share and have a good moment. 
We will start, we will first start with the speaker presentation that we have today, and after we will go through the open discussion. First of all, uh, we will define the concept of ethical artificial intelligence and how the technology can have an impact on the social life. On the second hand, we will talk about a specific case in concrete with our CityBeats company. And third, we will see how the support initiative as company as CityBeats and who most in use. And at the end, if you have more questions, it will be the question and answer time. But how I say at the beginning, the idea is to share. I will, I will ask on the chat box. And about us, who is GlobalM? So GlobalM, we are an IT recruitment agency, consultancy, but we are also here to support all of the founders, CEO, CTO, to grow and to share and to create also this technological community. So now we will start with the speaker presentation. So I will uh, unmute my microphone because now it's the turn to my, my guest. So I'm really proud of you. Maybe we can start with Ivan, the CEO of CityBeats. Um, yeah. Ivan, you can unmute and present you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I think I need uh, permission to share my screen. Now it's okay, you can. Okay. It's okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, can you see my screen? No. No? And now, yes. <laughs> you can share your screen now. Now, when I play, when I, no, it says that host disabled attendee screen sharing. Okay, so don't worry, I'll screen mine. Just wait. Okay, in the meantime, just to introduce you myself, I'm Ivan Caballero. I'm the CEO. Mm -mm. I'm the CEO and founder of CityBits. Uh, CityBits is a social understanding platform, um, helping governments and companies to better understand citizens' concerns in real, in real time and, and at scale. We're using artificial intelligence uh, to process big amounts of data based on text. And uh, with, this, um, with this data, we extract insights that help uh, our partners to react faster, faster and more efficiently to, to people's needs. Uh, I will share my screen, don't worry. Okay. Ah, that's great. Can you see? Yeah. Perfect. So just send. Yeah, go ahead. If you can. Yeah. So uh, the, the mission and the vision of, of CTV is to, is to power a more responsive society by uh, raising every single voice uh, from, from the society and uh, giving them the, the relevance um, that, it ha that it has. Uh, just to put you uh, some examples, we are working um, with uh, IDB Lab uh, all across Latin America to monitor in real time all the citizens' perceptions around COVID-19. Uh, and for this, we are processing all the data from internet we are structuring that data and we are extracting insights in order to uh, be able to, to help them to react faster and to have more context about people's needs. Can you go to the next one? Thank you. Um, today, I will introduce you, or we present you like five uh, impact implementations of the last year from Japan to Latin America. Can you go to the next one? Yeah, and uh, we say that we are a response-able AI, and why is that? 
uh, because first is that we are responsible. And when we say that we are a responsible AI, uh, we work in, in three main pillars. One is related to the privacy of the user. So all the information that we collect is totally anonymized um, and, um, uh, and we present it in an aggregated way. So uh, we never provide personal information. Second is related to bias. Um, you know, as many of you will know, uh, all the internet information is totally biased and uh, we have developed some um, algorithms in order to uh, detect in real time which is the bias of the models that our systems are uh, developing, like for example, gender or for example, aging, age um, and uh, other socioeconomic um, uh, data. And third is uh, we say that we are responsible because our technology is only implemented in use cases that impact in the society, that impact positively in the society. Okay. And ABLE, response ABLE, we play with this, uh, with this concept uh, because all the information that it's, all the insights that appear from CityBits are actionable. So if uh, an insight is not actionable, we don't deliver it. Okay. So, okay. Can you go to the next one? Thank you. Uh, in the last year, uh, we also measure ourselves uh, by the impact that we have in the society. So last year, we informed more than $150 million. Uh, we helped to uh, have uh, relevant information 90 days earlier uh, than average, uh, covering more than 30 countries and uh, raising more than 30 million of voices. Yeah, next one, please. Yeah, and I, I will go very fast uh, to the use cases, so you can, you can make questions and, and probably it will be more rich for you. But first is uh, related to um, dubbing. Uh, yeah, can you go to the next one, please? In Dublin, uh, we, are helping, um, we are helping the city to better understand in real time all the opinions and concerns about citizens. You know that normally uh, all these uh, city councils use surveys or use social media monitors. In our case, uh, we are aggregating all the information from social networks, from uh, phone call transcriptions uh, of, or from emails. Um, uh, we aggregate all that information, anonymize it and uh, extract all the insights. So, uh, the city of uh, Dublin can uh, react much faster. One example was um, we detected that uh, it was um, during some days there was a lot of cold nights and th there were some homeless having uh, struggling a little bit uh, about this situation and uh, the society were asking to the city council to react faster to help to to help them and um, yeah that was a, like a very simple example about uh, how this technology can be used. Thank you. Yeah, as an average, we helped uh, the city of Dublin to collect that information 90 days earlier and to increase the civic feedback volume in 250. Yeah. Another example, uh, social inclusion um, with uh, Fundación Once here in Spain. Fundación Once is, a, well, is, a, um, is an organization uh, helping um, blind people. Uh, yeah, can you go to the next one, please, Alexandra? Uh, what we uh, what we did with them was to use all the um, citizens of Spain voices in order to detect problems of accessibility uh, in infrastructures, uh, so they could uh, somehow create uh, better policies and to uh, put some pressure on the on the local governments in order to address them. Uh, it was really interesting because we were using like every single citizen as an, as an antenna, as a, as a brother of uh, problems in, um, of problems in uh, infrastructure. Um, so the, um, through Fundación Once, uh, all, the, all this information was really relevant in order to push uh, the governments to repair and to adapt all the infrastructure in order to be more accessible. Yeah, next one, please. Yeah, so uh, during, during six months, uh, we, increased, we increased more than in 250 times the, the issue the detection. Yeah, another, another example, um, 
probably many of you, if you are in Spain, uh, you remember that uh, four months ago we had some uh, floodings in the um, in the south southeast uh, of Spain, and um, we were working. Can you go to the next, please? To the next slide. Uh, we were working with uh, Telefonica. Uh, Telefonica is the the biggest uh, telco here in Spain. In order to mix all the uh, information, geolocation information from antennas, mobile uh, mobile antennas, uh, mixing it with internet information, so we could detect which infrastructures were damaged, and due to these damages, how this was affecting to the daily life of people. Uh, this was super interesting because we not only had all the numbers uh, about how many cars are going through this uh, highway or this this road or which road is which, yeah, the number of, of cars that is decreasing passing through this road. We were also giving more context about how, why these cars were changing the route or were choosing different roads. And uh, this helped to uh, decide and to create a better policy about mobility during this, um, during these floodings, during these natural disasters. Yeah, next please. Yeah, so uh, in only two weeks, uh, we covered more than 10 municipalities and we um, detected and informed budgets for more than 180 million euro. Next, please. Yeah, yeah, can you go to the next one, please? Okay, yeah, and uh, I think this is the last uh, use case. Uh, this is the one that we are developing with um, IDB Lab or IDB group. Um, IDB uh, will be introduced later by uh, Tetsuro, uh, but uh, is a multilateral uh, organization helping developing uh, and reducing inequalities in Latin America. Much more things of that, but uh, we are helping them to um, monitor across 26 countries right now, uh, all the social issues that are, that are appearing. Uh, you know, when you're a big organization, you need you need to have like an eagle view of uh, which things are more, which are the pr most pressing things uh, in different regions to, in order to prioritize uh, your actions. And this is our this is a role. We are helping them to detect uh, and to have uh, social early warning signs about which are the investments uh, they have to do. Next one, please. Yeah, right now, uh, yeah, this is a little bit. Um, old, so it says on the, uh, 11, but we are working in 26 countries and we are, uh, right now we are collecting more than uh, 15 million voices per month. Yeah, and uh, yeah, this is, this is uh, but I think I'm a little bit out of time, so I will, I will pass this one. Yeah, next one. Yeah, no. so uh, I think we have Q&A, so I'm open to any questions you may have uh, to, to solve or to develop any of the use cases or the concepts that I, that I already explained. Gracias, Ivan. Gracias por tu presentación. Ya acabo de animar el chat box. Por ahora no tenemos pregunta. No sé si alguien quiere... Pero esta ya mañana tenemos... se hace una hora que no haces nada, chaval. Ah, tenemos que... Tenemos todos los speakers. Tenemos una pregunta de Robert, que how can the public be confident that Citibits is anonymizing their personal comments? Uh, well, um, okay, let me explain you a little bit about the story of Citibits, and I think this, I will make it very clear. Uh, Citibits uh, was born out of um, a social experiment called Social Coin here in Spain. Uh, the, the experiment was about uh, understanding what makes people help others. And after two years developing this experiment uh, in collaboration with UC Berkeley and NYU, uh, we found out that one of the reasons that makes people helping others is to have visibility about the needs um, that are around them. So having a clear call to action. Uh, so we presented a paper uh, with these conclusions to the European Commission and they awarded us with a, with a grant in order to develop a technology that could help uh, understanding in real time the needs of the society. Uh, after one year of R&D, we launched the first version of CityBeats. And uh, since then, um, we, so 
first, the money comes from the European Commission, you know, um, so they are auditing us and all the technology has been um, developed uh, by, the, by their um, uh, supervision. Uh, this is one side. So we are purely a social player and, um, and yeah, our activity is totally transparent and, and happy to, and happy to, to open the door. So any, any, any public entity can audit or, or technology. Um, and on the other hand, um, so all the use cases that we are applying are based on social impact. So, um, what I would say that is that there, there's no, there's no way that uh, the that that we can use the data in a in a in a bad manner. I don't know if I was enough clear. Robert, do you want to? Is yeah. it clear enough? You can unmute your microphone if you want to say that it's clear for your side. If you want more more application. Yes, clear enough. Thank you, Robert. So now we have a second question from Aroa. It's uh, asking. She is asking. How does Citybits collect this voice? You mentioned emails, comments, and social networking. How does Citybits access to this data from different sources and in real time? Yeah, okay, that's a good point. Um, okay, let's say that there are two types of data. One is uh, public data and the other one is uh, proprietary data. Uh, when we say public data, uh, we, could, we could speak about uh, news, comments on news, uh, blogs, forums, okay? Then there's proprietary data, like for example, data from Twitter. Um, and then there's also uh, proprietary data from our customers, like for example, a city council that has all the emails uh, received uh, from the, by the Department of um, Civic, um, um, yeah, Civic Care or Civic uh, Response. Um, so for Twitter, we pay. So we are connected into their API. Yeah, and I, when I say Twitter, it can be any other social network, okay? We pay them in order to be able to access to their uh, API and extract uh, tweets. For um, internet general data, we work with uh, data aggregators, which is players that uh, normally have uh, agreements with all these uh, media news and, uh, and websites and blogs, so they can use them and aggregate it. So we pay also for that. And then there's data that is proprietary from the customer that normally the customer uh, delivers uh, this data uh, anonymized uh, or we anonymize for, uh, for, uh, to them. Um, so we can mix these three types of data in the same model. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Aroa, is it okay from your side? Or you can unmute your microphone just to answer that it's okay if you want more information. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, it's okay, I have just another question for Windad. So I understand you don't use private data from individuals, right? Because you mentioned calls um, when you work with Telefonica. So, and I believe you refer to the data provided from Telefonica, right? So you don't interfere private data, right? No, of course not. Uh, when I say calls, normally it's, it's call, phone call transcription. And, uh, no, uh, and always the user has uh, given permission to record that call. Okay, for example, when you call to um, 911, uh, normally they record it for quality purpose or just to, or just for legal purpose. So and you give permission to record that information. So what we do is to collect the, um, the transcription of, of this phone call without personal data. Okay, thank you. Is it okay from your side, Aroa? Yes, it's okay, thank you. Okay, we have a question also from uh, Laura Vicente, but it's quite the same because how it complies with GDPR rules and privacy rules, but you're already yeah. answering. And we have other question from Alexandre Lupion. What data source do you use? How can you assure you cover most of society? Yeah, okay, I think I tried to explain this in the beginning uh, when I was explaining about Ethics, ethics. So why, why do we consider ourselves an ethical AI? So, okay, we use any type of data in text. Okay, so we can we can use any type of data based on text. On one hand, on the other hand, we can use any any language also. So we are language agnostic and data source agnostic. Okay, 
Second is that um, we are focusing all our efforts into developing uh, pieces of technology that are able to um, detect and normalize uh, bias due to data. So, uh, for example, uh, if uh, we are using Twitter as a main data source for a project and we detect that Twitter is, uh, so the, the people that is, um, or the model is 60% male and uh, between an, an age of 20 and 40, which would be the, the normal, uh, our system detects this uh, so we can normalize the model. Uh, so this is the maths behind the, behind the models that we create. So we are generating not only the technology to process the text data, also the technology to uh, detect the bias and to be able to normalize the models. Okay, thank you. Alexandre Lupion, is it okay for you? Just yes or no, and uh, you can unmute. Yes, yes, that, that, that's fine. I, I can imagine that Twitter is quite a uh, young focus. Uh, do you have to make some, some filters sometimes or some, some correction to your data? Hmm. It depends on the topic. Um, so, for example, uh, if, we, we, if we speak about soccer, football, uh, there's a very concrete type of people speaking about this. Uh, if we speak about politics, it's wider, much wider. Um, if we speak about, um, I don't know, uh, racism, there's another type of people speaking, speaking about, about, about this. So the point is not, uh, is not having like a, okay, Twitter in, in Spain is 60% male, uh, is that having real-time uh, real detection of the bias. And this is, this is like our obsession right now. Uh, being able to detect, okay, with this topic, what's the sample? What's the universe? Uh, and um, how can we normalize in order to uh, be able to, to have a, a model that is wider and, and is not generating any type of uh, discrimination? Thank you. Okay, it's thank okay? you. Yeah, th thank you. Very clear, thank you. Thank you, Alexandre. We have uh, three other questions and we'll stop for this block. And so from Sandra Bayer, today more than ever, city leaders need current data about citizen opinions and actions. How quickly can you share information and help city leaders respond to issues? Uh, okay, this is a very tricky question. Uh, I can answer by the part that depends on me. Uh, and just to put you an example, with the COVID thing uh, in Spain, uh, you probably you remember around three months ago that one Saturday we were told to go at home and not leave home uh, for some time, right? Uh, that uh, Friday uh, we were speaking with the government uh, and they were very concerned about what was coming and we launched an observatory about the COVID in only 24 hours, okay? Uh, so on Monday it was running and that they were having insights about what were what were the most concerning uh, the, mo the biggest concerns of the, of the population in the, in that region um, okay and the second part how much time do, do do a leader need to take decision probably all of you will agree that it depends on the leader uh, so and it depends on the on the agenda of, of everyone and, and the context of that city or, or that country and, uh, but, but what I can say is that uh, as an average, we are collecting more than 90 days earlier um, the insights. So, and this is making a difference. Uh, just to put you another example, um, last month, uh, we detected two weeks earlier than the New York Times, um, um, a problem around hunger in two neighborhoods in Colombia and Venezuela. Uh, two, two, two weeks later, New York Times was uh, was um, breaking news. In breaking news, they were saying that. But uh, two two weeks be before we were announcing this to to BitLab, who took immediate action, for example. Thank you, Ivan. Sandra Beer, is it okay for your side? You can. Yes, unmute. thank you, Ivan. I, I think uh, cities around the world, hi, uh, cities around the world are really operating at the speed of trust. And I feel like City Beats is one of those um, companies that really gets to the authentic part of the problem. So I, I think the quicker um, 
these analytics can be shared, the better. I, I definitely see global opportunities for this, especially with COVID and uh, the other pandemics in our society today. So thank you, Ivan. Thanks very much, Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. We have uh, two last questions from you, from your blog. So Robert, if you are, from Robert, the same, if you are monitoring specific groups on social media like homeless, homeless canons, how can you be sure they want this collective voice to be used by your partner or clients? Okay. Uh, okay, let me rephrase because maybe I didn't explain it very well. Mm. So we are not monitoring what homeless say. What we, are, what we are monitoring or analyzing is what is being said. And if homeless appears in the conversations, then we can extract that piece, that, that insight, and, uh, and, we can, and we can add like uh, different layers of, of, um, of uh, insights on top. Like for example, in which neighborhoods, uh, what's the sentiment, what's the intent, um, what are the topics? Uh, like for example, cold, or cold night, no? As I was explaining before, uh, with Dublin, and uh, or or a society mobilization. Okay, of course, if the homeless uh, don't want to be heard, uh, that's okay. But they are not speaking. Who is speaking is people around that are seeing the problem and are using internet or different data sources to raise the voice about a problem that they see. Uh, of course, what we do is to collect that information, structure, and pass it to a decision maker. Um, but uh, if there is a decision taken or not, this is not our, this is not our, our responsibility or, or 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 what we or what we need to do, need to do. Thank you, Robert. Is it answering to your question? Yes, very well. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And the last one from you uh, from for the CTP part, it's uh, from Dora Angelov. Having such a wide reach, could you use your platform for warnings, a natural disaster, pandemic, rot, etc.? Yeah, yeah, totally. In in uh, in fact, that's what we are doing. Um, let me put you very short ex uh, examples of more use cases. Uh, in Japan, uh, we are working with Entity Data, which is one of the bigger or biggest partners, to um, to create models, preventive models after earthquakes okay so we have an earthquake we monitor all the all the problems that appear in different in different cities around around affected by the, the earthquake so in the next one we can have a preventive model so i mean examples of insights is this road gets blocked if this road if this road gets blocked uh food doesn't arrive to this neighborhood uh this hospital gets totally collapsed if this hope the hospital gets collapsed we need to, uh, people have to uh, bring um, the, uh, people injury, inju injured people into their houses. Uh, so this is, a, this is a, an example. Yeah, and another example right now that we are launching right now is about post COVID uh, situations. So another, another uh, case is related, you know, with the, with the COVID and the post COVID, there is a lot of unemployment and destruction of uh, some uh, type of jobs. Uh, so we are monitoring uh, how the job, se the, the job scene is changing in real time. Another, another case is related to um, um, digital breach. Uh, so how, uh, you know, everything is going digital. Everyone needs to get digitalized. Uh, all the companies need to uh, get digitalized. Uh, so what is this? Um, what is this? What, what is happening around, uh, about this? So it's happening that some people doesn't have the, the skills to follow this uh, speed, and uh, this this is generating like more diver not diversity, more gap, uh, and and lack of opportunities for some for some uh, groups of people. No, so we are also helping monitoring this in order to create like uh, contingency plans. And to help um, not increasing the um, the problems in the in different societies or different regions. Thank you, and Dora, is it okay from your side? You can unmute. Um, yes, um, so, sort of okay. Just a follow up question. So, could, for example, by monitoring other countries, let's say China, could you have? Um, had a, some sort of a warning for Spain saying, look, this is happening there and it's quite serious. You need to be careful before the government actually 
um, reacted to the pandemic? Uh, okay, this is not a crystal ball. Uh, so yeah, of course, if we were monitoring the whole world, probably we could um, we could generate early warning signs across borders, let's say. But let me let me tweak a little bit the question and the answer. So one of we could uh, we could evaluate uh, let's say towards Spain what people who want to travel to Spain is saying, which are the capabilities and which with uh, which intention they are going to to travel. Okay, so if if we have this uh, need in Spain, like okay, who is going to come from where? and with which intentions, we could work on that. Like monitoring everything and uh, warning everyone, is, it's much more complex. So one of the challenges of this uh, technology is to be able to do very good questions to the, to the data. Uh, in this case, I think it would be too wide. Understood. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank Dara. you. Thank you, Dora. We have just a comment from um, from Anne, just to say thank you for you, Evan. Awesome work, and she will watch the recording session. So from the chat box, it's the end of the question, and I think it's the end of your part. We can go to the next speaker. Thank you so much from you, uh, Evan, for your presentation. But don't worry, after the, the, all of the webinar uh, session, we have also a and a if some attendees have more questions. So now Perfect. we'll go through the, um, the next one. Ricard Fora Omedes. This is the Inclusion and Digital Innovation Manager at the Catalonia government. So for this case, we will talk in Spanish because we are a really international people. So we speak also English and Spanish. So I'm really glad if Ricard can unmute his, um, his microphone to welcome Ricard Fora Omedes in our webinar channel in order to understand la explicación ética de luz de la inteligencia artificial. Ricard? Ricardo está aquí. Ricardo, ¿Sí? ah, ¿Sí? ahora puedes, ahora sí. Ahora, vale. Dejamos vale. a Ricardo. El honor, el placer de acoger en nuestro webinar session, que es el responsable de la Generalitat de Cataluña. Te dejo presentar. Muchas gracias. Ah, muchas, muchas gracias a vosotros y, y perdonad porque por dificultades técnicas me he tenido que conectar por la, por la tablet, o sea que no sé a nivel de, de imagen cómo, cómo se verá. Uh, primer, uh, primero de todo, siempre me gusta situarme a, a nivel personal uh, en el contexto. Uh, eh, actualmente soy, uh, llevo, uh, llevo a cargo, soy responsable de los servicios de inclusión y capacitación digital en, de, dentro del Departamento de Políticas Digitales y Administración Pública de la Generalitat de Cataluña. Uh, yo creo que es importante destacar este punto. Primero, no ha hecho una pastilla, dos pastillas de que ya son un con d'aigua. Ha hecho un yogur de plátano y después te ha hecho una mica de plátano. Ahora, puedes ir. Ahora, sí. Digo, por primera vez en, un, en, el, en el gobierno eh, tenemos un, una, una consejería, un gobierno, es, uh, un departamento específico para políticas digitales. Uh, esto también es importante por, porque le dan un peso y una visión transversal a todas las políticas que tienen que ver en el impulso del uso de la tecnología y la aplicación de esta tecnología en cualquier campo uh, del, del propio gobierno. Segundo punto también para mí personalmente es importante, que es el de eh, mi visión como tecnoantropólogo. El tecnoantropólogo es una pseudodisciplina que un grupo de compañeros tecnoantropólogos tecno eh, impulsamos desde Barcelona, donde eh, somos un, ya, ya te digo, este grupo de antropólogos que hace tiempo que trabajamos en el ámbito de la tecnología, eh, rodeados y, y que nuestros compañeros son mayoritariamente ingenieros informáticos y lo que vimos importante es de aplicar la visión y las metodologías de las ciencias sociales, en este caso la antropología, y juntarlas con también 
la manera de ver y de trabajar de los ingenieros y de los informáticos. Porque mientras que unos estamos acostumbrados a analizar, analizar mucho y, y, y quedarnos en la propuesta de la, de la, de la problemática en que estamos analizando, los, los ingenieros, los informáticos, eh, lo que hacen es dar soluciones a una problemática que hemos detectado. ¿no? Y esta, esta simbiosis entre estas dos visiones, la de, la de científico social y la de ingeniero, creo que es la, 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 la que necesitamos en estos momentos para solucionar problemas como los que ahora, ahora hablaremos y por eso creamos esta visión de la tecnoantropología. ¿no? Uh, a más a más, a nivel particular, estoy llevando dentro de la, de la Ateneo Barcelonés toda la parte que es una institución de casi de 150 años en Barcelona para intentar explicar y llevar a la ciudadanía este lenguaje y esta, este discurso que, que tenemos nosotros muy, muy, muy aprendido, pero que quizá el ciudadano, el ciudadano de a pie, no acaba, no acaba de entender. ¿no? Um, He querido también aprovechar, eh, buscar una, 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 una realidad y una noticia reciente de esta semana pasada mismo. Esta, en la semana pasada, el día, 16, el día 11 en concreto, eh, saltaba esta noticia en diferentes medios. Eh, he querido destacar en un par de periódicos, en esta es el, eh, La Vanguardia de Barcelona, donde resalta aquí en titulares que IBM y Amazon abjuran de la tecnología de reconocimiento facial por, por su sesgo racista. ¿no? Es, un, es una, una, una noticia de impacto, creo, y en el ámbito de la inteligencia artificial eh, también mucho más. Eh, en concreto, IBM y Amazon eh, han, han, han reconocido delante de eh, en el entorno y el momento de protestas contra el racismo y brutalidad policial que hay tanto en Estados Unidos como poco a poco se ha ido extendiendo en el resto del, del mundo, um, IBM con esta decisión uh, reconoce que, uh, y, y desaconseja por su parte el uso de este tipo de, de herramientas de reconocimiento facial a, a, a través de la, de la inteligencia artificial. ¿no? Presionada por esta decisión, la, la su competidora Amazon anunció una moratoria de un año en el uso de este software uh, por parte de la, de la policía. La razón también es su preocupación por de haber detectado realmente sesgos racistas en, en, en los resultados de, esta, de, estos, de estos usos. ¿no? De hecho, hay un estudio en, en el MIT, de, en el Media Lab del, del MIT, que concluyó justo en 1918 ahí en el 20, eh, 2018, perdón, y aunque dice que la precisión media de estos productos oscila entre el 93,4 y el 87,9, las diferencias en función del color de piel y el sexo son muy notables. Ya lo podéis ver aquí en la, en la transparencia que he puesto. Um, el margen de error entre identificar un hombre blanco y una mujer negra es del 34%. Es altísimo, ¿no? Um, el 93% de los errores cometidos por productos de Microsoft, en este caso, afectaban a personas de piel oscura y el, 80, y el 95% de los fallos de Face Plus, eh, que es una alternativa china, se refería a las mujeres. Eh, aquí hay una, era una extensión de otro, otro periódico español que, que habla del movimiento Black Lives Matter, que pone en jaque la controvertida tecnología de reconocimiento facial. Y aquí, uh, investigando, y hemos encontrado a, una, a, la, a la investigadora de MIT, que, 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 que hacía referencia a los estudios anteriores, en el, en, el, en el slide anterior, nos dice que supone un reconocimiento de que la tecnología de reconocimiento facial, especialmente la implementada por la policía, se ha utilizado para socavar los derechos humanos y dañar específicamente a las personas negras, así como a las personas indígenas y a otras personas de color. Uh, como os decía, Amazon también se ha sumado la, al movimiento de, de IBM 
y, y, y es la que ha impulsado esta, este año, año de, de moratoria uh, en, lo, en los servicios de estos, de estos, de estos ámbitos. Uh, diciendo ¿no? y remarcando que, que abogan porque los gobiernos establezcan regulaciones más estrictas para regular el uso ético de la tecnología en el reconocimiento facial. Uh, en el mismo Congreso de los Estados Unidos está analizando la situación y, uh, y, y está empujado por una, una, la, la denuncia de la propia sociedad civil ¿no? y diferentes empresas que se han sumado a ellas. Uh, tenemos, por ejemplo, uh, está remarcado esta, esta frase ¿no? de el uso policial de la tecnología de reconocimiento facial debería ser prohibida en este momento. Y esto lo dice eh, Tinit Grebu, que es científica de datos y colíder del equipo de inteligencia artificial y ética en, en Google. Creo que tenemos suficientes alertas para, para ver que necesitamos no solo una, una regulación, sino un control de lo que está ocurriendo y cómo se está utilizando en, este, en estos ámbitos la inteligencia artificial. En el caso de España, por ejemplo, uh, es de los dos únicos países de Europa, junto con Bélgica, que no tiene, uh, no, no ha autorizado las técnicas de, de reconocimiento facial. Uh, no obstante, como también remarco más, más adelante, uh, uh, en, uh, sí se está probando, en concreto en, en la ciudad de, de Marbella, uh, el reconocimiento corporal. El reconocimiento corporal uh, reconoce a, sus, a las personas por el propio estilo de caminar o por la ropa que incluso que llevan y podría incluso reconocer las caras, pero esta función en estos momentos la, no, está, no está autorizada en España uh, y no, 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 puede, no puede activarse. ¿no? Uh, en, la, en la siguiente aquí podemos ver Uh, muchos ya de, de nosotros hemos pasado por estas, uh, por estas plataformas, sobre todo en aeropuertos, en este caso es el aeropuerto de, de Virginia. Uh, este es el, 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 el uso que se domina, uh, denomina entorno cerrado, entorno cerrado de uso de técnicas de reconocimiento facial eh, con, con inteligencia artificial uh, y donde eh, estos entornos cerrados tienen una tasa de éxito mayor de los denominados abiertos, que son como los que hemos visto anteriormente de, de, estas, de estas técnicas aplicadas a espacios abiertos, a, a parques, a, a calles, etcétera, etcétera. Aquí, bueno, os, os destaco también el, el, uno de los estudios a, que he hecho referencia, que, que podéis encontrar en, en internet muy, 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 muy detallado. Y un poco a, a nivel ya de, de reflexión, ¿no? uh, los, uh, los algoritmos hemos querido uh, aplicar uh, para que nos mejoren la vida ¿no? y sobre todo para, para facilitarnos procesos, acelerarlos y procesos sobre todo repetitivos. Y, y, nos, y nos han ayudado, nos están ayudando a tomar decisiones que mucho, en muchos casos es, son difíciles, de manera más, uh, más despersonalizada creyendo también que así los algoritmos tendrán una decisión más justa a la que tendríamos los, los propios humanos. Pero aquí he querido también destacar el caso de en Katy O'Neill. Katy O'Neill, en, en el libro que os recomiendo, Armas de Destrucción Matemática, dice que, claro, los, los algoritmos son entrenados y es una suma de decisiones que han tomado distintas personas. Eh, de esta manera, lo que estamos sumando son esas, estos sesgos que, que esas personas tenían. ¿no? Uh, o sea que no es una solución aséptica el uso de este tipo de, de tecnologías. ¿no? Pero ¿cómo podemos garantizar entonces esta, esta rendición de cuentas algorítmica cuando estamos hablando de fórmulas matemáticas muy complejas y que se presentan muy opacas? ¿no? Uh, y, uh, Todos estos algoritmos y es un poco aquí entran ya en mi, en mi parcela, ¿no? Todos estos algoritmos um, que nos ayudan a, a tomar estas, estas decisiones tenían que estar 
eh, muy reguladas y tendrían que, deberían ser auditables y eh, transparentes. ¿eh? Para que esto sea posible, mayoritariamente es mucho más fácil uh, promover uh, fórmulas de, de software libre y uh, que nos permitieran hacer lo que llamamos uh, la ingeniería inversa e identificar a los, dónde están los fallos en estos, en estos algoritmos. Um, en este caso uh, es cuando viene el, el, papel, el papel del ciudadano. ¿no? Uh, y aquí es de, eh, tenemos, entramos de lleno en la necesidad de, uh, de la alfabetización que decimos y capacitación del ciudadano en, en todos estos aspectos. ¿no? Eh, otro punto clave, eh, resalto también, por ejemplo, lo podemos ver en el hecho de la, de, por ejemplo, el Reglamento General de Protección de Datos en, en Europa, no va acompañada de una capacidad real de monitorizar los derechos y responsabilidades de, en los que se hace referencia. Y quiero, eh, ya para, para cerrar, eh, eh, exponer el caso de que estamos nosotros impulsando desde desde el Gobierno de, de Cataluña, que es la Carta Catalana de Derechos y Deberes Digitales de la Ciudadanía. Un poco para, para paliar, para intentar dar respuesta a todos estos, todos estos interrogantes que ahora os estaba, os estaba comentando. Esta carta, eh, estáis viendo una captura de la, de la página web, eh, donde podéis, eh, os podéis descargar la versión tanto en catalán como en castellano como en, en inglés y podréis ver también la metodología que hemos seguido, una metodología totalmente abierta a partir de un grupo, un grupo primero reducido de expertos, luego lo hemos abierto a un grupo ya de unos 60 o 70 expertos y la tercera, la tercera corona, digamos, es a partir de la participación de la ciudadanía que ha hecho sus aportaciones y ha enriquecido lo que es el el texto y el debate. En estos momentos tenemos uh, detectados estos, uh, estos derechos y deberes que veis uh, en, esta, en este slide, el acceso universal a Internet, el modelo de gobernanza de Internet abierto, inclusivo y con diversidad de actores, la libertad de expresión y de información, la innovación digital, creación, acceso y distribución del propio conocimiento, la protección de datos y la privacidad de la información, garantía de la capacitación y de la inclusión digital y en este punto sobre la ética en el ámbito de la inteligencia artificial y la gobernanza algorítmica en el sector público y en el sector privado y la creación de mecanismos de salvaguarda de los derechos, de los derechos digitales. En la carta, también en estos momentos, es una carta que creemos que es, es viva y continuamente se tiene que ir actualizando a la realidad que vamos viviendo día a día. En estos momentos estamos trabajando en dos aspectos nuevos para ampliar, que una son los derechos y deberes de, de niños, jóvenes y adolescentes y el impacto de la tecnología en el, en el, en el mundo del trabajo. Aquí hay todo, una, sobre todo en, en todos estos meses que hemos padecido la, 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 la pandemia, Uh, hemos, hemos detectado que algunos, algunos derechos que parecían ya superados, como era el, el derecho a la conexión de, toda la, de todos los ciudadanos, uh, están más vigentes que nunca. Es necesario que toda la ciudadanía tenga la posibilidad tanto para formarse como para poder interrelacionar con sus familiares, con sus amigos, como para poder trabajar, seguir trabajando es necesario que todas tengan el acceso y tengan la capacidad para poder eh, seguir haciendo esta actividad eh, de la misma manera y en, y en remoto. Eh, tenéis toda, toda la información, como os he dicho, en, en Internet, pero cualquier eh, duda, cualquier eh, sugerencia que tengáis, estaremos encantados de, de ayudar y, y de comentarlo. Muchas gracias, Ricardo. Realmente fue muy interesante. Yo creo que el, el contenido muy relevante, muy detallado, como además la noticia de IBM Amazon, es muy un caso concreto. Muchas gracias. Tenemos una pregunta por parte del público, Ricardo, de parte de César, que le gustaría saber cómo puede el ciudadano de a pie ayudar a promover e investigar con software libre. ¿Alguna idea? Él está de acuerdo en que no debe quedar todo en la empresa privada y código cerrado. 
Bueno, aquí uh, el, el, el secreto es lo que hemos, hemos comentado, la, la posibilidad y la, la capacidad del ciudadano, primero en entender la importancia de todo esto y luego la, la, la posibilidad también, si quiere, de poder auditar todos estos procesos. Uh, aquí es donde uh, todo lo que es uh, todo lo, uh, lo que sea a nivel open uh, facilita, facilita este control y, fa, y fa, facilita esta auditoría de realmente lo que, los procesos que hay internos y cómo se toman esas, esas decisiones que nos afectan eh, y mucho cada vez más a, a todos los ciudadanos. De alguna manera, nosotros sí que si, si algo que nos afecta y que es a partir de una decisión de una empresa, de una administración pública, queremos saber y si no estamos de acuerdo, pues que queremos pedir responsabilidades y poder, y poder reclamar. ¿no? Cuando esta decisión la toma una máquina, tendría que ser exactamente igual. Esta posibilidad tenía que ser la misma. Los derechos del ciudadano tendrían que ser exactamente lo mismo. Esto solo es posible, como digo, con una, con una capacidad con una formación mínima para que el ciudadano sea consciente de qué es lo que tiene, lo que tiene delante y cómo tiene que interlocutar con él. Muchas gracias, Ricardo. César, uh, no sé si te puedes unmute que te, para saber si ha contestado o no a tu pregunta o si quiere más información. Sí, muchas gracias, Ricardo. Eh, también quería saber, eh, ¿crees que se podrá llegar a auditar eh, pronto, en un, un tiempo corto, en un plazo corto, eh, si se podrá llegar a, vamos, a auditar de manera clara, o sea, de manera transparente. Uh, bueno, en un plazo corto no, no es fácil, no es fácil, pero yo creo que se están acelerando las cosas. Eh, en lo, en los dos ejemplos que, que os he puesto al principio, hace, hace pocos, pocos meses o semanas incluso, parecían imposibles, ¿no? Que dos, eh, que dos corporaciones de, como, como eh, IBM, como como Amazon, incluso como Google, eh, se cuestionaran muchos de sus, de sus proyectos y la manera que están trabajando. Yo creo que esto es también una, una, una esperanza de que, de que, lo que lo que parecía utópico, parecía imposible hace muy pocos días y cada vez yo lo, lo, veo, más, lo veo más cercano. Ahora sí, eh, el, el, la, la participación y el papel de la ciudadanía tiene que, ser, tiene que ser muy relevante. No podemos dejar en manos de... De, de, de intereses eh, privados, en este caso, o de gobiernos, eh, únicamente de gobiernos, las decisiones que nos afectan directamente a la vida de, la vida de las personas. Uh -huh. Ok, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, César. Tenemos una pregunta de José Luis. ¿Cómo conseguiremos que el algoritmo no tenga sesgos si los datos de entrenamiento históricos ya reproducen sesgos? Ajá. Bueno, esto es un, es un problema Uh, claro, de si, si las personas que trabajan y que entrenan estos algoritmos uh, son unas personas, normalmente se ha hecho un estudio ya muy concreto de que el, el, la, la mayoría, el, el 90% de las personas que trabajan uh, entrenando o diseñando o programando estos algoritmos son personas de raza blanca eh, de entre 30 y 50 años y con unos estudios concretos, elevados, y eh, en, una, en, un, en un entorno geográfico también muy concreto. Eh, si todas estas, estas personas que son los que crean estos algoritmos, los entrenan, los auditan, eh, lo que estamos haciendo es pasar estos sesgos a, estas, a, estos, a estos algoritmos. ¿no? La manera es abrir, abrir la posibilidad de que, de que eh, los programadores de estos algoritmos, los que los los que los programan y los que los diseñan sean lo más uh, abiertos, los más plurales posibles. Y aquí entramos en, en, en problemáticas mayores, como es, por ejemplo, la exclusión uh, femenina del mundo tecnológico. Estamos hablando de que no llegan a un 20% las, las mujeres que están trabajando en la tecnología. Esto ya es un sesgo directo, claro, que impacta en, en el desarrollo de, de la tecnología como... Como, eh, como te he dicho, la, la, uh, el, nivel, el nivel social también y la, la, la localización y la cultura que hay detrás de la mayoría de las personas encargadas en, en, en realizar estos, estos algoritmos. Gracias, uh, Ricardo. José Luis, ¿está bien para ti si quieres unmute? Sí, sí, perfecto, gracias. 
Gracias. Tenemos una pregunta de Alexandra. Me parece que un código abierto de plaza el problema. ¿Quién estudia y juzga estos códigos? ¿Haría falta un, un ente neutral? ¿Lo tenemos? De momento no lo tenemos. Aquí, eh, por eso, estas, estas iniciativas, yo creo que eh, la, 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 la que os contaba que hemos hecho desde el Gobierno de Cataluña, lo único que quiere es provocar este debate y hacer que este debate se haga global. De hecho, esta misma semana ha aparecido ya en la prensa que el Gobierno de España y también uh, eh, ha iniciado un proyecto exactamente igual, de las mismas características, el mismo título y con la misma metodología. O sea que ya, ya si, si se va provocando este efecto multiplicador, yo creo que es la, la, la manera, ¿no? que, que, que realmente a, abramos a los gobiernos, a la ciudadanía, la posibilidad de participar en, de manera activa en, las, en este tipo de, de decisiones y en, y en el impacto de estas estas decisiones. Gracias, Ricardo. Alexandra, como siempre, está bien. Puedes unmute o si quieres. Muy bien. Sí, muy bien, Ricardo. Muchas gracias. Gracias a ti. Muchas gracias. Por la chat box no tenemos más otras preguntas. Ricardo, ¿quieres añadir algo más antes de pasar a Tetsur o tal vez Iván o Tetsur, ¿quieres comentar algo? Bueno, com comentar uh, que, 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 que el, uh, con Iván el... el, el en City Beach, eh, yo soy, he tenido la, la oportunidad de utilizar uh, la herramienta y realmente uh, eh, yo creo que es, una, es una, una de las vías de poder, de poder detectar y de y poder aplicar políticas públicas realmente uh, ligadas a lo que está pasando casi casi en, es, en ese mismo momento. ¿eh? Es una herramienta que creo que, que tenemos que dar a conocer y que tenemos que, entre todo, fortalecer y enriquecer, porque, porque estas herramientas necesitan el, el feedback y la colaboración de los, de los propios eh, usuarios. ¿no? Muchas gracias, sí. Si, si, me, si me permitís también, uh, yo creo que, eh, gracias por la mención, Ricard, y, y, y reforzar un poco el mensaje que, que, que Ricard comentaba, Después de unos años ya trabajando con distintos gobiernos y distintas eh, organizaciones, eh, las, iniciativas, bueno, las iniciativas que está llevando a cabo la, la Generalitat de Cataluña eh, y en concreto el equipo de Ricard son, son referente para, para, mucha, para muchas otras regiones, muchas otras ciudades y muchos otros países. Con lo cual, eh, bueno, solo, solo reforzar un poco el mensaje de que, de que tenemos de tener la suerte de tener a Ricardo aquí compartiendo sus experiencias con nosotros. Gracias. Gracias, Iván. Gracias, Ricardo. ¿Queréis añadir algo más o podemos pasar a de todo del tema de City Beats, de, después del ayuntamiento, de la organización pública? ¿Quién también ayuda a ese tipo de organización? para este propósito. Y hablar con Tsetsuro. Tsetsuro, ¿estás aquí? Yes. Uh, hi. Um, yes, in English. Just a quick question. How many minutes I have? Um, I, I, I try to, to, to don't, finish. Don't worry. From my side, it's okay. We can go further. Don't worry. Okay. okay. Um, I, I, try to be, I try to be efficient. Uh, my intervention in the, you know, trying to finish in a couple of minutes or five minutes, something like that. But mm -hmm. thank you very much and for the organizer to, to invite me, uh, to give me uh, an opportunity uh, to present and what we are doing, uh, especially uh, to support the AI-related initiatives in, in um, engaging both public sectors and private sectors. And the, um, uh, first of all, um, my name is Tetsuro Narita. I, I don't know how many of you know uh, the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, I work for IDB Lab. Well, Inter-American Development Bank is IDB, and then I work uh, the department uh, specialized in supporting private sector called IDB Lab. And the, uh, we are um, a regional development bank specialized in Latin America, and my department, IDB Lab, is specialized in supporting uh, uh, um, in, in innovation ecosystem or, in, uh, or entrepreneurial ecosystem in Latin America and the Caribbean region. And the, um, we are strongly, well, we, we are IDB Lab, so uh, we um, identify ourselves as laborat innovation laboratory inside the IDB group, proactively is seeking the connection of new solution, technology, and innovation with development agenda, and to and and, and, and uh, 
uh, organizing projects uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean region to see uh, those new innovations, uh, solutions, and ideas work or not. And the, if, if it works, we try to, to, to find a way to um, scale up those solutions. And if, if, if it doesn't work, uh, we try to learn uh, to improve our approaches in the future. No? So, so that's why we characterize ourselves as innovation laboratory inside IDD group. And the, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the, the main activities for us to support Latin, America, Latin American entrepreneurial ecosystem or startups is through um, investments in venture capital in Latin America. So we invest in venture capital funds in Latin America, which uh, identify uh, innovative, innovative and uh, potential you know, uh, uh, companies um, um, to see uh, if uh, you know, new solutions and new products and services uh, can improve the lives of people in Latin America and the Caribbean region. And the, the, through um, our um, investment activities in venture capital funds in Latin America, uh, uh, one of uh, uh, one uh, uh, one trend that we have been um, seeing is that not only B two B, but the uh, several startups or companies um, uh, have been innovating. Not only you know um, providing uh, uh, products and services to the the, the, the private sector, but then also or, you know. Um, provide an ideas and solutions uh, potentially to public sector. I mean, B2G uh, approach or GovTech. In the, um, I really enjoy the intervention of Ivan and Ricardo because uh, uh, the, the interventions of previous two panelists are kind of validation of, of what we are doing. Because on one thing, uh, we are seeing uh, public sector's strong interest in, um, um, considering the potential of newly available technology, but then of course paying attention to the ethics, fairness, bias, etc., etc., because it is related to social program or social impacts. But then on the other hand, you know, uh, uh, then what I seen and then also Q and A session between Ivan and then other participants on this panel is, you know, uh, is also a kind of validation that of of our belief that this kind of new, uh, new, new technologies or new solutions can improve or can collaborate with the public sector paying due attention to the topics I already mentioned, like an ethics, fairness, bias, and uh, transparency, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, based on our uh, belief that uh, uh, several innovations with B2G approach or GovTech can, can, can increase the collaboration public-private, uh, we initiated, you know, uh, and, and, the, and the starting the, the, the AI technology, of course, and we, 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 we are looking at several technologies, uh, not only uh, artificial intelligence, AI, but and also in, uh, internet of things, uh, virtual reality, drone, blockchain, et cetera, et cetera. But the, uh, uh, to, to look at the potential of this kind of, of newly available technologies and then connecting public private. And we, 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 we started and with AI specifically launching an initiative called Fairlack. I think uh, the participants are looking at the website of Fairlack and the, and the, and the, you are also seeing the URL. So you can go, you can, you can visit the, the, the website and which is newly launched, but the, uh, we will be adding more and more information uh, in, on, on this website and what we are doing through Fairlack Initiative. Basically, Fairlack Initiative is a public and private sector collaboration. So uh, inside the IDB, uh, uh, one department specialized in collaborating with public sector and ourselves, the department specialized in working with private sector. So two departments, one public and one private, uh, joined the effort uh, to initiate this, uh, this, uh, this initiative. So the public sector side, uh, you know, working with uh, governments and the municipalities uh, to increase the awareness, pros and cons of the newly available technologies and uh, to, to, to train 
the decision makers uh, to be able to deploy, for example, uh, AI-based system, AI-based uh, uh, solution, uh, you know, uh, to, to the field, uh, paying attention to, to all the topics that we have been discussing. But the, on the other hand, and why uh, we are uh, collaborating from, from private sector side is because uh, when public sector or governments are interested in implementing a technology-based solution or AI-based solution, um, not only big corporates, but then we believe that here uh, there is a huge opportunity or space for startups or entrepreneurs to innovate a, you know, uh, with, with new solutions and products. So that's why if, if public sector is interested in procuring uh, uh, technology-based services, uh, we want, to, we want to, to make the private sector players, especially entrepreneurs and, and the startups, be prepared to be able to respond to, to, to the needs, but from the beginning, paying huge attention to the ethics, fairness, and bias, or, or, or responsible handling of data, et cetera. So, so, so that's why uh, through FairLack, uh, our, our, our idea is to, 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 to collaborate with entrepreneurial ecosystem in Latin America, having entrepreneurs and startups in the center, uh, uh, finding the way how uh, we can support as multilateral organization uh, to, for, for those entrepreneurs and startups be prepared uh, with ethical uh, approach and, and, and the responsible, ha responsible handling of data. So um, a, a, that is uh, what we are doing and a concretely uh, what we already started is to create a kind of uh, we call entrepreneurial journey because uh, when, when we, we speak about entrepreneurs or startups, there are so many uh, stages from ideation, uh, a, a minimum viable product, uh, go to market or, 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 or market traction and scale up. And the, depending on um, in, in which stage the company is found, maybe uh, uh, you know, the, the, the demands or needs may vary. So uh, we, are, we are dividing the, the, the entrepreneurial stage of, of ecosystem and you know, for each stage of entrepreneurial journey, uh, we are convening the relevant players uh, with um, uh, supporting mechanisms so that uh, those entrepreneurs and startups, uh, their uh, uh, growing growth stage can incorporate an ethical approach and responsible approach and to be able to develop uh, their products and services and based on AI. So uh, that is uh, what we are doing in the in the in that uh, 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 supporting mechanism uh, combining you know, all the entrepreneurial ecosystem players uh, to support entrepreneurs and, and the startups is is precisely for example for responding to the questions uh, 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 the participants today raise so for example um, a, like um, I think as for, 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 for supporting entrepreneurs uh, uh, with our ecosystem development is maybe three approaches. You know, one, uh, how, how to improve their internal policy or governance. So for example, data governance and the ethics committee or corporate governance, whatever, but then one thing is in how to improve uh, entrepreneurs, you know, uh, uh, their uh, the own you know, internal policy or procedures or, or, or committees. Um, and the, another another aspect is in how to how to how to support them, uh, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, something uh, uh, specific on 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 technological side. For example, you know, uh, the uh, algorithm auditing or legal advice, or, or even you know, support uh, uh, from data scientists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, we we will be creating through Fialax uh, initiative a platform. Uh, so that uh, after uh, self-diagnosis of the entrepreneurs and uh, what they need, what, what are the, their demands to connect with specialized and service providers and to be able to support entrepreneurs uh, to go through the, the journey. And the, the last one is maybe, you know, how to support uh, with right communication for entrepreneurs. Even though entrepreneurs and startups are, are, are you know, taking into consideration the ethical approach and the, and, the, and the responsibility approach in their product development, et cetera, but the, such kind of an approach 
should be communicated uh, 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 in a light way uh, to to other players like an investors or or, or, or public sector or, 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 or decision makers, uh, uh, you know, uh, to be able to respond in you know uh, in a better way, like uh, to the questions and you know, we uh, we we listened today you know, uh, between the conversation uh, uh, Ivan and and the other participants. So uh, the, the Fair Act is in a nutshell uh, is a public private sector uh, initiative and then on, on, on private sector side and uh, we are uh, we are creating a kind of, uh, of tools or matrix how we can support entrepreneurs in, in not not us being uh, like a data scientist and we are you know just an, a, a multilateral uh, um, you know, organization so our idea is you know in, 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 in which aspects we can support entrepreneurs connecting dots of the, the ecosystem players and so that and entrepreneurs and startups uh, can continue developing their products and services and based on AI. So that is, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, my, my intervention in the, well, um, we are in developing such kind of tools and to be, to be in, in, uh, published in, in, in the website and you, you are seeing. So um, um, I, I hope uh, this kind of conversation continued and uh, once you have, uh, identified and interesting uh, information through this website and if you have questions I'm, I'm open to, to, to continue discussing and just to, to finish uh, believe or not I'm Japanese but then I speak Spanish so uh, welcome to receive any question or, or, or comment uh, also in Spanish thank you very much thank you so much Tetsuro now you can hear me thank you so much for your presentation and for your time, yes. We have a question. So Tetsuro, have you thought about studying how artificial intelligence can be applied to have a more sustainable natural environment in the future? Maybe you can create a startup oriented on that. Yes, um, the, the short answer is yes. And because you know, we are interested uh, uh, in, you know, for example, climate, uh, climate change related projects in Latin America and the Caribbean region and then we are proactively seeking combining uh, any technology to solve the, the, the problem so we are open to to to, to listen to any proposal you may have uh, talking about an AFELAC initiative in particular uh, we we started the initiative somehow uh, specialized or concentrated on personal data or, or handling the, the personal data and related to environment uh, or you know uh, climate change, not necessarily uh, personal data are engaged, but the, 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 the maybe outside the fair lack context, uh, we, we can we can um, we can we can consider any any AI related uh, project for climate change or, 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 or environmental issues. So uh, the short answer is yes. In the in the it, it can be inside the fair luck initiative, but then outside the context of fair luck initiative, but then we are, we are open to, 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 to listen to any idea in, 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 in either way. Thank you so much, Tetsura. As usual, Cesar, do you want to add something or is it clear for you? You can unmute. Yeah, 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 clear. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. So do you have more questions coming from the attendees or maybe Ivan or Ricardo you want to add some comments? I, I'm okay. Uh, open to any, to any question or conversation that uh, the others want to start. Okay, perfect. So yes, thank you so much for uh, all of you to your presentation. So now this is the time of Q&A roundtable. I think during all of your presentation, we had several questions during your presentation, Ivan, also Tetsura and Ricardo. So I'm asking just if you have more questions coming from the attendees, or maybe you want to debate about one subject between you, uh, speakers. No, Tetsur, Ricard. No, no. Y podemos hablar español también. Podemos sí, hablar español. Okay, so just uh, one question from my side, and maybe I, I, I can speak Spanish. Um, 
me gustaría escuchar de parte de, de, de ustedes, Ricardo y Iván, ese sobre, su part, sobre su percepción este, sobre, sobre el estado de desarrollo de uso de inteligencia artificial en América Latina, porque nosotros escuchamos mucho la palabra inteligencia artificial este, como potenciales proyectos en América Latina y el Caribe, pero en realidad hay pocos ejemplos o pocos casos de uso realmente con inteligencia artificial o machine learning. So, este, comparando con, la, con, con, con lo que ustedes están mirando en Europa, este, ¿cómo caracterizarían ustedes el estado de arte de inteligencia artificial o machine learning en América Latina y el Caribe? Bueno, Iván eh, tiene, creo que tiene un par, como, por, por lo menos un par de ejemplos interesantes de, de, de la aplicación en América Latina, ¿no? Sí, ah, sí, nosotros, claro, nosotros hemos, eh, hemos aplicado eh, nuestra tecnología en América Latina de diversas maneras, pero también intentando contestar de manera frontal a, al debate que habría Tetsuro, eh, nos estamos encontrando con, o sea, nosotros no, normalmente no abordamos los proyectos de manera directa, sino que vamos con un partner, con un, una empresa colaboradora. Y en América Latina pues estamos haciendo bastantes esfuerzos para eh, encontrar colaboradores que quieran o, o, que, o que identifiquen eh, oportunidades en las cuales poder implementar tecnología como la nuestra en casos de uso concretos. Y la verdad es que llevamos aproximadamente, tenemos como 16 colaboradores ahora mismo en diferentes países de América Latina y todo el mundo está, nos está acogiendo con las manos abiertas porque parece que no hay soluciones parecidas a la nuestra, por un lado. Por otro lado, también parece que la adopción de este tipo de tecnologías es incipiente. Eh, todavía no hay muchas experiencias de éxito, que ya sabéis que normalmente lo que, lo que hace que las cosas se aceleren son las experiencias de éxito, pues parece que no hay demasiadas. Y, y, y bueno, y esto hace pues que sea un poco lo que se llama en marketing un blue ocean, un, un océano azul de oportunidades donde todo es posible eh, porque, porque no hay un precedente, un precedente previo. Entonces, bueno, yo creo que, y no es solo en, en América Latina, ¿eh? en Japón nos encontramos un poco lo mismo, que podríamos decir que es como la, la otra parte, ¿no? Y, en, y aquí en Europa también nos encontramos con muchas organizaciones y muchos gobiernos o alcaldías eh, o, o empresas que todavía no han hecho nada alrededor de este tipo de tecnologías ni se han planteado cómo les pueden ayudar. Gracias, Iván. Ricard, ¿quieres añadir algo sobre el tema? No, un poco lo que, lo que decía Iván, porque yo conozco ejemplos precisamente de la, de la mano de de Iván, que de aplicaciones que se han hecho en América Latina y con, y con diferentes gobiernos en los que yo directamente estoy participando en América Latina y ayudándoles en, en proyectos, cuando les propones trabajar con inteligencia artificial, lo ven un uh, poco lejano aún, ¿eh? les, cuesta, les cuesta adoptar estas, estas experiencias, todo que tienen un gran interés en conocerlas, pero cuando las tienen que implementar, uh, hay un poco de, yo diría, que vértigo en, en, en aplicar estos, estos conocimientos a su ámbito. Supongo que también aquí hay un problema de que los, los comentaba de, de talento que sea capaz, de talento digital, digamos, que sea capaz de, de que estas, estos proyectos se puedan quedar localizados en el mismo territorio. Yo creo que lo, lo que no sería correcto, creo yo, es implementar estos proyectos en remoto y que luego no se puedan no puedan seguir creciendo de alguna manera con las personas y con las empresas que hay en el mismo territorio. Yo creo que quizá uno de los problemas que tenemos en estos momentos es, es que falta este, este primer tejido que permita que aterricen estos, estos proyectos. ¿no? Gracias. Gracias, gracias a todos. Tenemos una pregunta para Iván. ¿En qué país trabajéis? Porque hay tanto enfoque en Latinoamérica. Pues, eh, mira, estamos trabajando, tal vez el, el mayor contrasentido es que el país donde desde el año pasado hemos trabajado más activamente es Japón, 
y es porque NTT Data, que es una, la, la segunda o tercera telco más grande del mundo, es, eh, es japonesa y nos seleccionó como la mejor startup del mundo. Y desde entonces empezamos a trabajar con ellos. Eh, también estamos trabajando en España, evidentemente. Eh, tenemos proyectos eh, en, en, en otros países de Europa. Eh, y Latinoamérica nos parece muy interesante porque hay mucho reto social porque hay mucha concienciación de que hay que resolver muchos problemas y están muy abiertos a hacer, eh, hacer eh, muchas pruebas y a, y a empujar proyectos. Y la otra es porque uno de nuestros eh, principales colaboradores es, es el BIT, que, que, de, que de alguna manera está dinamizando toda la región y, y nos está facilitando mucho la, la tarea. No es lo mismo para... Por poner un ejemplo muy sencillo, no, no es lo mismo eh, tener que evangelizar o tener que estar explicando lo que pueden hacer todas estas tecnologías a base de hacer pruebas de concepto mal pagadas, hechas muy rápido, eh, con, 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 con defensores y detractores dentro del mismo proyecto, que tener a un colaborador que se cree al 100% lo que estás haciendo y te, y, te, y te empuja y te anima y te ayuda a mejorar cada día. Entonces, bueno... Yo te diría que no trabajamos solo en Latinoamérica, trabajamos en todo el mundo. Podemos levantar un proyecto en Turquía, pero dándole a un botón, pero, pero realmente los compañeros de viaje son importantes y estamos encontrando muy buenos compañeros de viaje en estas regiones. Muchas gracias. César, como siempre, puedes unmute para saber si ha contestado o no a tu pregunta. Sí, muchas gracias, muchas gracias, Iván. Me parece muy interesante el debate ético en torno a la inteligencia artificial. La verdad es que me parece muy, muy interesante. Gracias. Gracias a ti. Gracias. Bueno, yo creo que por el chatbox no tenemos más preguntas. Al final, yo creo que este tema... Uh, ha sido muy interesante porque muchas personas han preguntado. Yo creo que por mi parte voy a hacer el, el debate solo si alguien quiere levantar la mano y preguntar algo o si vosotros como exponente queréis añadir algo. If you want also in English, because I, I know that if we will close soon the session, if you have some question, more question, this is the moment. Um, for, for me, uh, this is the truth speaking. Um, just uh, for me uh, to finish, um, um, and then also related to the previous question of why Latin America uh, for CTV is one. Of course, and we are invited CTV, and we provided financing to, to, to incentivize and to go to Latin America. But the, it, it is because and also based on our perception, belief, and the findings. Uh, I, I'm working for IDB for years and the, always working for Latin America and the Caribbean region in that sense and maybe my knowledge is not perfect regarding the Asia Africa but the Latin American uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem or, or, or Latin American openness to the innovation and the, and the advance is uh, uh, interestingly advancing uh, mm -hmm. more you know uh, open and uh, eager to learn uh, a new technology and the potential of new solution. So, so, so that's why um, um, I, I think, um, so uh, if, if Latin, America, Latin American entrepreneurial ecosystem or ecosystem in general is open to think about new technologies or to accept or tweak and then implement new technologies, it is the time to think about ethical use or, or, or responsible handling of personal data or data in general because you know uh, this this kind of topics the sooner the better so uh, i think uh, this conversation is very um, timely for me it not only for for for, for people you know or I, I don't know what kind of people are participating but not only happening in europe but the, it, this is very timely uh, to make this kind of conversation happen in latin america so thank you very much from my side Thank you very much, Tetsuru. We close the session. So, if you want the speaker, uh, Aleponen, si quieres añadir algo, solo será la sesión para decir saludar. And uh, from the audience, we have only thank you. Thank you for the webinar, the interesting and challenging topic. So, we can be really proud of you. Thank you. And I'll let you the last word for you, and after the last word for me, and it will be the, at the end of the session. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure from my side. Uh, I've enjoyed a lot and uh, 
looking forward to speak with any of you that want to reach me uh, through email or through social networks. Thank you, Ivan. Muchas, también, muchas gracias y yo creo que es un debate, como se ha dicho, que, que está empezando, pero que, que le queda aún mucho recorrido. O sea que encantado de, de hablar o de, o de intercambiar información, opiniones con quien quiera a través también de, de mi email. Muchas gracias. Antes de Sur, already said thank you, but you can uh, again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 oh, thank you very much. And then I, I think, um, well, I, I don't know how I, I can I can share my personal uh, 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 contact information. But the, yeah, um, any any question, maybe I don't know directly or through Global M. Um, I, I'm I'm happy to 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 have offline conversation or connection uh, with, with 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 you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, I would love to say thank you. Muchas gracias, Ricardo, por tu tiempo. De verdad, lo, lo agradezco mucho. Uh, we just received several thank you from the attendees, so really, we can, we can be, you can be proud of you. Don't uh, worry, tomorrow I will send you the, um, the recording of the session, so we have all of the video, in that way you can cut and to have it with your authorization, of course. And also, I will uh, send you with the authorization. You have uh, the contact of the the attendees, if they want, they can contact you, okay? And if you want, with your authorization, with the GPDRs uh, law, protection law, data protection law. So this is uh, the end of the session. Again, thank you so much. The topic was really relevant, interesting from my point of view. And I would love to officially close the session and you can uh, leave a uh, step-by-step the session. Thank you and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.